All right, today we begin a new message series, which I've entitled Living in the Spirit. Now, last Sunday, we completed a message series, which uh, was called Experience God's Power. It was about miracles. And as I was thinking and praying about the next series after this Experience God's Power series, I really felt the Holy Spirit leading me to this topic of, of living in the Spirit. You see, when we study miracles, sometimes people get frustrated. Say, so, you know, we're studying all these great miracles we see in the Bible, but I really don't see anything happening in my life today. And I, I just kind of see a disconnect between those things that happened in my life. And why, why is that? Well, miracles are not done by people. Miracles are done by and through the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is the one that we need to understand better. The Holy Spirit is the one we need to cooperate with more fully in order to see God move in our lives, to see God move in our church, to see God move in our family. And so in this series, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is undoubtedly the most misunderstood, unappreciated, and controversial member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet, that Holy Spirit is the source of all the power, all the wisdom, that you and I need in order to follow Jesus and carry out God's purpose for our lives. And so the Holy Spirit is incredibly important. In fact, as we'll see today, the Holy Spirit is the only member of the Trinity that's living inside of each and every believer. The Holy Spirit is the only member of the Trinity that is actually present on the face of this planet. And so, in this series, we're going to be talking about how the Holy Spirit can impact our lives each and every day. This is the same Spirit that was active in the creation of the world. We see in Genesis chapter 1, the Spirit was hovering over the waters as God created. This is the same Spirit who was poured out on Pentecost. And the same Spirit is active today across this planet in the lives of of millions upon millions of believers. He's continuing to work and move in powerful, powerful ways. So this morning we're going to kick off this series with a message entitled, The Person of the Spirit. We're going to try to answer the question, who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? A lot of the ideas out there about the Spirit are, are simply wrong. Some people Probably many people think of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, as simply a force or an impersonal power. Yet others think of him as a scary ghost. Where did that come from? Well, you see, the King James translation from hundreds of years ago translated, Holy Spirit is Holy Ghost. Now, back then, ghost meant something different than it means today. It meant more like spirit. But today... Do you like to hang around ghosts? Would you like to go into a haunted house? You see, it's a scary thing. And some people are afraid of the Holy Spirit. But it's the Holy Ghost. We're not going to use that anymore after this Sunday. We're just going to call him Holy Spirit because I don't want to scare anybody. Call him the Holy Spirit or, or the Spirit. The Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit is not a force. He's not a, uh, he's not a ghost. He's... He's a person. He's a person that you can get to know. Jesus told us in John chapter 14, and I'd encourage you to take out the message study guide and outline. It's in your bulletin. It's a white page there. It has the scriptures written out on the outline as well as study questions on the back. I encourage you to uh, either, if you're in a life group that's going through the study questions, uh, go through them in your life group or... Or even if you are, you can go through these questions as you spend time with God, studying his word and praying each and every day. And that will help you to better understand, to better fill your mind and hearts with the message this morning so that it isn't just taken away by Monday morning. Jesus said in John 14, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. 
The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And so here Jesus refers to the Spirit personally. Uh, he doesn't say, and, it, uh, and he will give you another counselor. Uh, let's see. The world cannot accept him. He doesn't say it. That's a personal pronoun that Jesus uses. He's a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit, Jesus says, is another counselor. Well, who is the first counselor? Well, the first counselor is Jesus. Jesus was with his disciples. He counseled them. Uh, he gave them guidance. But was Jesus going to remain with them forever? No. He was going to go back. He was going to send back into heaven after he rose from the dead. And so this is a, another counselor who the disciples were aware of. He was with them, but he was going to be in them in a special way after Jesus ascended into heaven. The Spirit was going to be with them forever. It's the Spirit of truth. He's going to counsel you in the truth of God. He's going to lead you and guide you in God's truth. And that same Spirit that was with the disciples that became in them is available to us today. So let's begin a, a study of the person of the Holy Spirit. We need to understand the personality of the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is a person, then he, he has a personality. He must have and do the kinds of things that a, a person does. You see, each and every human being is made in the image of God. And so many of the things that we see in one another are characteristics that God has. And the Holy Spirit is a person. He's part of the Trinity. And the more that we can think of and relate to the Holy Spirit as a person, the closer we'll be to him. The more we can be filled by him. So the Spirit, first of all, has an intellect. 1 Corinthians 2.11. We're going to look at a lot of verses this morning about who the Holy Spirit is. We're going to jump around. don't normally do that, but it fits the topic. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So each of us has a spirit. A spirit inside of us. It's the internal part of us that relates directly to God. And we're going to talk a lot more in this, in this series about the relationship of our spirit with the Holy Spirit. But this verse says that our, our spirits know what our minds are thinking. You see, our spirits and our minds are not the same thing. The Bible teaches us that, that our mind is part of our soul, and that's different from our spirit. And so our spirit knows what our, what our mind is thinking. And in the same way, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, knows the mind, the thoughts of God the Father. He knows everything about God. And so the Holy Spirit can communicate the thoughts of God to our spirits. But he has an intellect. That's the main thing. He, he thinks. He knows the thoughts. He, he knows the mind of God. He has a mind as it will of his own. The Holy Spirit also has feelings. Ephesians 4.30 And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I'm going to focus on that word grieve. To be grieved is to be sorrowful, to mourn. Our sin grieves the Spirit. It makes Him weep. It makes Him mourn over our sin. And so we're, if we have a relationship with somebody, is it a good thing to make them grieve over something we do? Now, it doesn't really do something for the relationship, does it? And so we're basically commanded here not to grieve the Holy Spirit through our actions, through our attitudes. Of course, that's not the only emotion the Spirit has. I mean, all these things we could go on for all morning. The Holy Spirit is joyful. And how much better to make the Holy Spirit rejoice than to grieve the Spirit. And we make the Holy Spirit rejoice as we walk in God's ways. The Holy Spirit has a will. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. He distributes them to each one just as he determines. This passage is speaking of spiritual gifts. 
The Spirit distributes spiritual gifts among different people in the church. Now, the distrib distribution of the Spirit's gifts are not done randomly. The Spirit makes a decision. It says He distributes them just as He determines. He determines which person should get which gift or gifts. He thinks. He makes decisions. He has a will. The Spirit performs actions. Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And so these are two very important verses. We're going to come back to them as we go through this series. But God's Word here tells us that the Holy Spirit intercedes or prays for believers. He acts. He does something here. And the beauty of this prayer, this prayer of the Spirit, is that it's 100% according to the will of God. It's 100% according to the will of God. Are our prayers 100% according to the will of God? Rarely, probably. And what happens if your prayer is totally in line with the will of God? It's answered. Every prayer that's prayed according to the will of God will be answered. And so when the Spirit prays through you, when you cooperate with the Spirit in prayer, that prayer is a prayer perfectly in line with God's will. And in the future, we're going to look at how we cooperate, what we must do in order for the Spirit to intercede through us. But this is just one of many, many actions that the Holy Spirit performs. He does all kinds of things. He speaks to people. He teaches people. He convicts people of sin. He reveals things to people. He guides people. He performs miracles. He casts out demons. He heals the sick. We already said he distributes spiritual gifts. And the list could go on and on. The bottom line is that the Spirit has all the attributes of a person. And we need to get to know him better. So let's think for a minute about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Each person in the Trinity is, is holy God. They are separate and distinct, and yet there's a unity about them that's hard to describe. God the Father resides in heaven. Jesus the Son came to earth. He was born of the Virgin Mary, lived a life, perfect life, never sinned. Crucified on the cross, buried three days later, he rose from the dead. Forty days after that, he ascended back into heaven. Jesus is not here on this earth anymore. He has a glorified body, a body you can touch, a body that can eat. He is in heaven. At some point in the future, Jesus is going to return to this earth. That's the second coming. That's what we long for. That's what we wait for. And he's going to make everything right when he returns. And so which person of the Trinity is on the earth right now? That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who's here. And oftentimes, I understand what people are saying, but they talk about asking Jesus into their heart. Jesus really can't, like, get in your heart. He's in heaven. What we really mean by that is Jesus comes into our lives through the Holy Spirit. He lives within us through the Spirit of Jesus. That's how he lives within us. And so we experience God through our relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit. And so not only must we understand the personality of the Spirit, we must also believe in the divinity of the Spirit. Now I've been talking about this, but it's important to, to, uh, to confirm, to to really say that the Spirit is divine. There are theologians and churches and things that no longer believe that the Holy Spirit is divine. The Holy Spirit is just as much God as Jesus or the Father is. And so God lives inside each and every believer through His Spirit. So what are some of the divine attributes of the Spirit? Well, the Spirit is eternal. Hebrews 9, 14 how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? 
And so the, here the Spirit is referred to as the eternal Spirit. Eternal means He has always existed. And so as God, the Spirit has no beginning. He has no end. He always was. He always is. He always will be. That's what eternal means. And so the Spirit is eternal just as Jesus and the Father are. The Spirit is all-knowing. John 14, 26. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, Jesus is talking here, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Well, in order for the Spirit to teach us all things, what does he have to know? All things. The Spirit knows everything. He has all the wisdom, all the knowledge of God. He's going to teach us all things, remind us of what Jesus said. In theological terms, the Spirit is omniscient. He knows everything about everything. There's nothing that he doesn't know. And in case you missed it, this verse is a promise. The promise is going to teach us all things and remind us of everything that he said. I might qualify all things mean teach you everything you need to know to follow God's plan for your life. Not necessarily everything you want to know. Especially the why questions. God doesn't answer every question. And if he doesn't answer your question, you don't need to know the answer. So don't get mad at God. If you need to know the answer, he'll tell you. If he doesn't, carry on. You have everything you need to follow his plan and purpose for your life. The Spirit is all-powerful. Luke 1, 35, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Here the angel is talking to Mary. The Holy Spirit is going to come on you, the power of the Most High. Speaking of the Holy Spirit is the Most High's power. And as we read through the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we see the Holy Spirit associated with the power of God all through the pages of Scripture. Power and Spirit go together. The Spirit is the ability of God to do whatever He wants, whatever He desires in the earth. The Spirit is omnipotent. The Spirit is ever-present. Psalm 139, where can I go from your Spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. And so the Spirit is everywhere present at the same time. Okay, the Spirit is here. The Spirit is in China. The Spirit is in Russia. The Spirit is in Africa. The Spirit is everywhere present at the same time. That's another attribute of God. The Spirit is omnipresent. And so the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Now, since the Holy Spirit has these divine attributes and others as well, it means he's infinitely more powerful than any other person, any other being. You see, in the whole, I want to say universe, but it's really God is bigger than the universe. God created the universe. God is the only uncreated being. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the only uncreated beings that exist. Everything else is created some people get it mixed up. The most powerful enemy of God is Satan. But Satan is not on equal footing. Satan is a created being. He's a created spirit being. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. He's not omnipresent. He's not eternal. He had a beginning. He's created by God. And so there's no contest between the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the enemy. And since the Spirit of God lives inside of you, if you're a believer, then he's able to do incredible things in and through you. There is nothing that he can't do. The Holy Spirit always seeks to lift up and exalt Jesus as Lord of Lords. So how can a person experience the reality of the Spirit? Well, we've talked a lot about understanding who the Holy Spirit is this morning. It's, it's knowledge, understanding facts about Him, and that's a good thing. But it's not sufficient to change your life. It's not sufficient to make a difference in the world. It's one thing to know about a person. It's quite another to know a person. 
right? You and I know about all kinds of famous people. You know, we can say, I know about President Obama. Do I know President Obama? No, I never met him. I've never spoken to him personally. So it's quite a, one thing to say we know about somebody and to say we know somebody. Knowing about a person doesn't really do anything for you. And so God wants to move each one of us from knowing about the Holy Spirit to knowing him personally. Now the Holy Spirit indwells every believer. Romans 8, 9 says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. And so here God's Word makes it very clear what is the defining attribute of a believer is that the Holy Spirit indwells them. The Holy Spirit lives inside of them. On the other hand, those who are, who are not believers do not have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. And so we need to be very clear here as we talk in this series about activity of the Holy Spirit that every believer has the Holy Spirit living in them. If you don't have the Holy Spirit inside, you're not a believer. But that's just the starting point. All too often, it ends there for people. There's much more of the Spirit that we must, must experience in order to fulfill our purpose in life. And Jesus taught us to ask for the gift of the Spirit. Luke eleven thirteen, Jesus teaches, if you then Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now since the Holy Spirit automatically indwells every believer when they put their faith in Christ, what is Jesus talking about here? Well, this verse confounds a lot of people so they don't mention it much. But Jesus is talking here about the promise of the Father. He's talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is a separate experience from salvation. You have to ask the Father to give you this gift, this infilling of the Holy Spirit, which is available for every believer. And why do you need the gift of the Spirit? Well, it's in order to receive the Spirit's power. Acts 1.8, Jesus said to his disciples, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so here Jesus is stating to his disciples that when you are baptized in the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, in response to waiting on the Lord, in response to asking him, you're going to receive power. Power to do what? Power to be Jesus' witnesses. To have the boldness to share the gospel with other people. And this power is intended for every believer. Every believer is to be an effective witness for Jesus, winning other people for Jesus on a regular basis. Now, the Spirit's power is not only for witness, it's also for communicating with God, functioning in the gifts of the Spirit, and we're going to talk more about those things later in this series. But God wants each and every person here to experience the reality of the Spirit in their lives. Not just mentally to believe in the Spirit, but to relate to and experience His presence each and every day. Now let's talk a little more about experiencing the reality of the Spirit in your life. When you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within your spirit. And yet for many people, that's where their experience with the Spirit stops. They don't have the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, flowing through each and every aspect of of their lives. When a person receives the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which we're going to talk about next Sunday in more detail, the Holy Spirit fills you. The Holy Spirit is released into every part of you. And what is the image of baptism? Let's take water baptism. Water baptism, you're immersed into water. You're completely surrounded. You're drenched with water. Well, that's the same image of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Bible says Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. You're immersed into the Holy Spirit. You're surrounded with the Holy Spirit. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what happened for the first time on the day of Pentecost. And from that time onward, is available to each and every believer who asks the Father for the gift of the Spirit. 
Now as we read through the New Testament after Acts chapter 2, this experiential reality of the Spirit is assumed for each and every believer. It's assumed that everyone has been saved, obviously, to be a believer. Secondly, baptized in water. Thirdly, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Peter talks about it in his sermon on the Pentecost, Acts 2.38. You need to repent. You need to be baptized in water. You need to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so if you have not been baptized in the Spirit, begin to pray, begin to ask God as we go through this series to baptize you because the promise of the Spirit is for each and every believer of all time. So God wants us to understand the personality of the Spirit so we can relate to Him as a person. We must believe that the Spirit is God Himself so we respect and submit ourselves to His will. And finally, God wants us to have an earnest desire to experience more of the reality of the Holy Spirit in our lives. There's no end to experiencing more of God. There's no end to experiencing more of His Spirit. And God promises us in His Word that if we hunger and thirst for Him, that He is going to fill us. He's going to fill us with His Spirit. Now, the first step to having the Holy Spirit living inside of you is to become a believer. To become a believer, you admit that you've sinned. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and you commit your life to following Him. So I'd like to give you an opportunity this morning if you have never prayed a prayer like this or if you have, you'd like to recommit your life to the Lord. We're going to pray a simple prayer. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads. If you'd like to make this commitment or recommit your life, pray along with me. Say something like this. Father, today, I admit that I've sinned. I've done wrong things. I haven't been following your plan for my life. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross, took my sins upon himself and paid the price that I might be forgiven. Please forgive me. Come into my life. I commit myself to following you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior from this day forward. And for those of us who are already believers, let's pray as well. Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who you've sent to be our counselor and our guide. Help us to learn better how to relate to and communicate with your spirit each and every day, each and every moment of the day. Forgive us for forming our opinions and understanding of your spirit from other sources other than your word. Today we confess that we need more of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We want to experience the reality of his presence each and every day. Open our minds to new things that the Spirit wants to teach us. And the things that we've heard from others that are not from your word, the things that we've been taught in the past that is not of your Spirit, God. Take those things away. We ask that you help us to be continually filled with the power of your Spirit. We need your help, God. We need your help to be effective witnesses. We need your help. The help of your spirit to fulfill your purpose for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.